Welcome to Focus on Scholarship. I'm Bettina Gardner, Dean of Libraries and your host for today's session. Our goal at the Graduate School and University Libraries is to bring a focus and an awareness to the exciting scholarly and creative achievements of our academic community. Our guest today is Dr. Dustin Wygant. Do Dr. Wygant is a licensed clinical psychologist and assistant professor of psychology at Eastern Kentucky University. He received his bachelor's degree in psychology at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, prior to completing his master's degree and doctoral degrees in clinical psychology at Kent State University in Kent, Ohio. Prior to joining the faculty at EKU, Dr. Wygant worked as a forensic psychologist for three years in Akron, Ohio, conducting forensic psychological evaluations and providing expert testimony for various courts. Dr. Wygant's primary research interests include the conceptualization of the psychopathic personality and the DSM-5 model of personality disorders. He and his students are currently examining the DSM-5 proposal for antisocial personality disorder in a prison here in Kentucky. His other research interests include the detection of malingering and deception in psychological evaluations, as well as the use of personality assessment in forensic and medical settings. In addition to his academic position here at EKU, Dr. Wygant provides forensic psychological consultation and evaluation through his private practice and works as a consultant for the University of Cincinnati Division of Forensic Psychiatry. Welcome, Dr. Wygant. Thank you. Um, I am excited uh, to hear about your research because um, I'm a big fan of Criminal Minds. Yeah and all those shows that talk about right. what we think are um, psychopathic personalities. Right. So tell us about your research in the academic sense. Well, it's interesting that you bring up Criminal Minds. I get a lot of students who seek me out because of uh, my background in forensic psychology and uh, oftentimes people just have this idea of forensic psychology from watching Silence of the Lambs and Criminal Minds and whatnot. And, uh, when they actually find out that I don't chase serial killers during the weekend yeah. <laughs> in between classes, um, they get a little disappointed. But then, you know, when I explain what we actually do as forensic psychologists, I think students really find that interesting. Okay. Um, so tell us, tell me a little bit about what you mean by the assessment and conceptualization of psychopathy. Psychopathy? Of psychopathy, excuse me, you've yeah. taught me to say that because I say it like people on television, and the assessment of malingering. Well, those are two interests of mine that really emerged from my uh, training and background as a forensic clinical psychologist. Um, I guess I'll start with malingering. Um, oftentimes when people are involved in forensic psychological evaluations, whether it's for a competency to stay in trial or maybe, if, maybe during an insanity evaluation or, or maybe a disability evaluation, they might have a motivation to misrepresent their psychological status. Mm -hmm. So they might wanna mm -hmm. play crazy or act more injured or disabled in order to get money or to evade criminal resp you know, responsibility. So one of the things that I do is look at how psychological tests and psychological evaluations can better detect when people are trying to do this. And it's really important because you don't want someone to um, be awarded a disability or some kind of personal injury case if they, if they weren't actually injured or didn't have a psychological mm -hmm. injury. And of course criminals, you don't want them to be found insane uh, if they've actually, right. you know, should be found responsible for the crime. So it's an important issue um, in forensic psychological evaluations. In terms of psychopathy, uh, that's always been an interest of mine, you know, why people, you know, do heinous things, why they act certain ways, uh, particularly as it pertains to crime. Um, and so I've always been fascinated with, like, you know, how someone can be mm -hmm. that way. Um, and during my training at Kent State University, um, I worked with Yossi Ben Porath, who was my mentor, and his specialty was personality assessment. And so working with him and working um, on various forensic, psycho forensic psychology tr uh, training centers, I was able to kind of think about personality and criminal behavior and how those two things you know, came together. And over the past couple of years, I've collaborated with you know, colleagues at different universities, and we've come up with a number of studies um, to look at the basic underlying personality traits that seem to perpetuate criminal behavior and motivate criminals to act like they do. 
That's and that's some of the work we're doing here at, 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 at EKU. It's fascinating, and I think the general public is fascinated in a completely uh, different kind of way. Yeah. We see that every night on television. Sure. Um, how is it that you became interested? Well, certainly the training uh, at, at Kent State, I had a lot of great opportunities to work with the professors and, and psychologists at different training centers um, to really shape my interest in forensic psychology and personality assessment. But I guess I've always been interested in these kind of things. My, my two grandfathers uh, were big influences in my life. One was a physician up in Chicago who helped start a hospital and, and worked with patients and did some research. And my other grandfather was a judge and sheriff down in Laurel County, so I have roots in Kentucky. And so it seemed like a natural bridge between medicine and the law, um, which you know, has always been an influence for, uh, for, an influence for me. I think it's so interesting when an academician's personal life influences where their research path takes them. Right. Um, seems like a real genuine interest when there's something personal about it. So for a very general audience, can you tell, tell us a little bit about your current research with the DSM-5? Right. So the DSM is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. It's uh, basically the book that contains all the symptoms and criteria for different disorders. And we currently have the DSM-4. However, this May of 2013, the DSM-5 is going to be released. And so there's going to be a big push to complete research on this new diagnostic manual. The particular disorder that I'm interested in falls under a group of disorders called personality disorders. Mm -hmm. So you think about personality, it's kind of how you act and kind of how you, know, how you think and how you interact with the world. Well, when that becomes maladaptive, either because you can't control your behavior or your emotions are out of whack you know, all the time, that kind of pushes your personality into a personality disorder. And the particular personality disorder that I'm interested in is antisocial personality disorder, which is the disorder um, that's often linked with criminal behavior, aggressive behavior, violent behavior. So the current DSM-4 um, basically looks at a number of behaviors and, and uses those behaviors to classify personality disorders. So for antisocial, you essentially have to have persistent criminal behavior, aggression, lying, stealing, cheating, you know, those kind of antisocial behaviors that go against the social norm. Uh, the DSM-5 is going to essentially retain that model, but they've included a model in the appendix to further study an, an alternate way of thinking about personality disorders. Rather than focusing on their traits, but by rather focusing on the underlying personality traits, or particularly maladaptive personality traits that can be used to conceptualize personality disorders. So for antisocial personality disorder, we think of those individuals as having higher levels of antagonism. Mm -hmm. They tend to be antagonistic, uh, mean-spirited, mm -hmm. callous towards individuals, and they also tend to have high levels of disinhibition. They have con you know, difficulty controlling their behavior, uh, f can't conform to social norms, they're impulsive, they're reckless, they're irresponsible. And so what we're studying in this prison located mm -hmm. outside of Danville, Kentucky, called North Point Training Center, um, is really comparing this trait model that's been proposed for the DSM in comparison to the current DSM-4 model of personality disorders. And we're also linking that to psychopathy. So you, we talked about psychopathy earlier. The psychopath is kind of an extra special antisocial person. Instead of just engaging in criminal behaviors, the psychopath tends to have some additional emotional characteristics and interpersonal characteristics. So they tend to be fearless. Uh, they don't get aroused by potentially dangerous situations, and they don't, they don't get easily stressed out. Uh, interpersonally, they also tend to be more domineering and aggressive, um, overly assertive and manipulative in how they you know, interact with other people. So it's kind of like they have the antisocial characteristics, but they have all these extra you know, interpersonal and, and personality kind of traits. Um, the field kind of looks at psychopathy as kind of what it's always been trying to capture because the psychopath is, you know, potentially dangerous person and uh, we've also linked the underlying causes of psychopathy to some areas in the brain so it seems to be more biologically based. Um, so what our study is doing is comparing the DSM-5 
proposal for personality disorders with the DSM-4, and we're also looking at it with various models of psychopathy, and there's different instruments, tests, and clinical interviews that have been developed to measure psychopathy. And the other part is we're actually looking at neurocognitive functioning, so we're studying um, whether or not we can link these various disorders or changes in the disorders to difficulty in controlling behavior from a neurocognitive perspective. So we have different tasks that measure impulsivity and affect recognition, whether or not the, the, the individual can recognize the different emotions that people display. And you're doing this all with students. Yes, that, I couldn't do it without students. Well, tell tell me a little bit. Um, last question: How how it is your what your students are doing right. um, in this project? Well, this is a project that took about a year to set up, and during that time, I worked with our department chair, Dr. Rubaker, to establish a clinical research practicum. So we have clinical psychology graduate students who have to learn clinical assessment skills, interviewing skills, and whatnot. And they also have to complete external practicum as part of their training. So I thought it would be a great idea to combine research with their clinical training. And essentially what the students do as part of their training in graduate school, they go anywhere from two to four days a week to the prison and complete these five-hour batteries individually you know, with each of the inmates. We also have undergrad students who get to go and observe and um, are part of this. They will actually administer some of the self-report personality tests and get to observe and kind of sit in on, you know, on the various interviews. What, that's a fantastic learning experience for our students. I'm sure it demystifies the, the profession a little bit for them too. And well, it's interesting. You know, going to prison you know, multiple times a week right. and kind of working with these inmates, I see some very optimistic students who maintain that optimism, but they also kind of learn the other side of, of humanity and working with, you know, with some of the inmates. And I think it really brings these conditions uh, alive to them when they actually get to sit Right, as close sure. as we are with a psychopath and, sure. and spend five hours talking to them and really un unraveling their personality. Oh, I, think, I think it's fascinating. What lucky students to get that experience. Thank you, Dr. Wygant. That's it for this edition of Focus on Scholarship. I would like to thank you, Dr. Wygant, for taking time out of your very busy schedule to join us. Please join us next time as we continue our series of webcasts celebrating the scholarly and creative achievements of faculty and staff here at Eastern Kentucky University.